Hi, my name is John Kitchens, and I've started this uh, retina-specific vlog, video, YouTube channel thing um, because I love YouTube. Uh, I love retina, and I love retina surgery and editing retina videos. Uh, anyone who knows me knows that's a real passion of mine. And I love cameras and videography and other things like that. So this was just a way to kind of merge everything together into one place. Uh, I've met hundreds if not thousands of friends over the years giving talks all over the world. Uh, and, uh, and I just want to be able to share some of the things that I presented, some of the surgeries that we do, some of the interesting cases and interesting things on a channel like this so that um, if you don't have a chance to go to conferences, don't have a chance to go to meetings, uh, let's say you're in Asia or India or Africa and you're a retina specialist and you want to see interesting videos, how we do things here in the United States, how our retina specialist works, um, you can easily tune in and check out my channel. And if you have an interest in what a retina specialist does, this may be a great channel for you. In light of that, one of the things that I'd like to do and I'd like to do more of is just kind of talking to the camera about uh, things of interest. And one of the things that's really come up recently is the uh, inflammation associated with Bay of View or Brolicizumab. And for those of you that don't know, Brolicizumab is a new anti-VEGF therapy that just launched here in the United States a few months ago. Um, by Novartis, and it was FDA approved uh, by the courtesy of two phase three trials, the Hawk and the Harrier studies, which were excellent studies. And the real benefit of this anti-VEGF drug is, is that it looked like it dried the retina out really, really well, and that the durability of this drug may be between eight and 12 weeks. And for most of our anti-VEGF therapies, the durability tends to be more along the four to eight week line. So this was gonna give our, chance, our patients a chance to uh, get drier, uh, maybe a little quicker, have a little bit better visual p potential, uh, and maybe go less frequent in between uh, injections. And shortly after the launch here, there's been reports of a, a few cases of vascular occlusion. Now, this vascular occlusion seems to be uh, related to intraocular inflammation which is something that we've seen with other anti-VEGF therapies, uh, including uh, a Flibercept, which we did a poster on shortly after its launch. The real difference, however, is, is that I haven't seen, and I don't think we as a specialty have seen cases that result in vascular occlusion and, and some reports of substantial vision loss. And frankly, some of these cases can be kind of scary where you see the blood vessels narrow and the retina turn white and ischemic. And the question really is, is will patients who suffer from this recover their vision? So it's certainly been something that's, that's raised a lot of awareness and a lot of concern. Now, I wanna say up front that Novartis did not hide any of this information from the FDA. The FDA approved this drug knowing that this was a side effect. And in fact, if you look at the uh, European um, uh, Medical Society, the EPAR, E-P-A-R um, literature, which would be the same information that the FDA makes their decision on, um, they show that there was a 0.8% retinal artery occlusion rate. Now, was this something that was presented at a lot of meetings and was kind of an upfront data point that we knew about as retina specialists? No, it really wasn't. But regardless, the FDA knew. And so it was something that they knew that was an issue and still approved the drug. So um, that's really important because Novartis didn't hide anything when it comes to to this drug and the potential side effects from the FDA. Now, I will say there are a couple of things at issue right now, however, and, and I will admit I've used Bay of View before we knew this inflammation uh, was an issue, and I can tell you that it dries really impressively well. And in fact, uh, the four or five patients I used it in were patients who were actively leaking one month after an aflibercept injection, and I gave them a single Bay of View injection and brought them back a month later, and they were drier. Um, I think all four of them actually, uh, including some patients that had like RPE rips and fluid from RPE rips. So it is an incredible drying agent, and I think it's something that hopefully these issues will get sorted out. But back to my point, 
Um, the real issue that I have is not uh, with Novartis and getting it approved and all that kind of business. I think the bigger issue is, is, is at the Macula Society, they presented some of this inflammation data, the real world data, and they said that they had nine cases in 57,000 units shipped. Um, and, and I think this was maybe meant to kind of give a sense of security. However, if you look at the phase three data, there's no doubt that that rate stated is 0.8%. So I don't think we can imagine that anything changed between the phase three Hawk and Harrier and what we're gonna see in real life. And so my concern is, is if 57,000 vials have shipped and there's a rate of just a little under 1%, could we be facing a, a, a time, and this is, by the way, not 1% per injection, this is 1% per patient or 0.8% per patient for the entire study. So you can't really mix data that says, hey, this is how many vials we shipped, and this is how many events we've had reported, which by the way, that number is 14, not nine. So the bottom line is, is that if you switch a patient over to Bay of you, they have about a 0.8% chance, at least in the Hawk and Harrier studies, of having some sort of retinal arterial occlusive event, which can potentially be very, very bad. And so uh, the concern would be is if you have 57,000 patients being started on Bay of you right now, could we see 5,000 patients that end up having something like this? I, I don't know, but the Hawk and Harrier data would support numbers kind of like that. So it's, it's of concern. So there shouldn't be any reassurance in saying we have this many vials shipped and we have this many cases reported. Number one, we don't have any of those vials that have been used. Uh, number two, oftentimes these instances, and in fact, I think in all of the instances in the Hawk and Harrier studies, these occurred after a, a injection, um, a previous injection. So it takes typically at least two injections. Um, I know there's been advice given not to re-inject anyone who's had inflammation. I think the concern is going to be, can this happen in people who don't have inflammation? So you have really no warning sign that it, it could happen. Uh, and, and can other anti-VEGF therapies kind of prime the pump for this? You know, in the Hawk and Harrier studies, these were treatment naive patients and so they're a different patient population than these patients that have had numerous other medications along the line and we're going to be switching them over to that. So that's issue number one. Don't be reassured by this 57,000 vials shipped. We've only had 14 cases reported. We may just start seeing these cases coming. Uh, the second thing is, is that there's a lot of hype now around an international launch and I guess my thought would be is, look, if there's a problem with this medicine, if it causes something that we haven't seen before that's potentially vision threatening, um, why are we rushing to launch this thing internationally? Uh, press pause, figure this out. Uh, be upfront about this issue to the international audience because they're, they're gonna get it and they're gonna see these side effects just like we're seeing them. But I don't know that it's wise to rush out and say, let's go ahead and launch this thing internationally and get it, get it out there as quick as we can. Figure out what's wrong, if you can figure out what's wrong, and fix it. Um, speaking of what's wrong, we don't know if it's, if it's an E. coli cell culture type thing where there's some sort of toxins that may be a contaminant. If it's the size of the molecule, Lucentis is not much bigger than the uh, brolicizumab, whether it's the concentration, it's the type of protein or what. That's something for, for the scientists at Novartis uh, to figure out. But anyway, the bottom line is, is that uh, it's very unfortunate because this drug looks like it would be an improvement as far as drying is concerned. Um, but the safety profile is something that we really haven't seen with this retinal artery occlusive thing and it's very very concerning and it can cause substantial vision loss and so it's something that i think deserves to be uh to have a pause put on it now if you're a patient and you're receiving bay of you uh, and it's working for you certainly talk to your doctor it may be something that you say hey look i'm willing to take that 0.8 percent risk and and be observed for any kind of inflammation if you are a patient getting Bay of you and you see floaters or any kind of problems after an injection, let your doctor know. That's of utmost you know, critical importance. And if you're a prescribing physician that hasn't used this drug yet, uh, certainly it's something you wanna be aware of. And I think it's important to have that discussion with your patients. So 
I'm sorry to be a little long-winded on that. This is something that I've really thought a long time about and have been uh, delving into over the last month or so. And so I just thought this would be a great platform to kind of get that out there and discuss it um, with you and continue to enjoy these surgical videos. And I'll try to do more of these face-to-face -face updates if that's something that everybody would be interested in. Once again, thank you so much for watching. Uh, like, subscribe, enjoy, um, and have a real passion for retina. Thanks for watching.